So let's start. Why do border walls matter? Well, we could start almost anywhere. But I'd like to start with the era of what Zach Dumay recently called fancy sports cars drawn in cubism. <laughs> now this is a car from 1989, to be exact, um, and perhaps as further proof that archaeologists really like ancient things, you may be see, my, see me driving one of these around Grand Rapids. Um, and incidentally, 1989 is also the year in which a bright-eyed New York businessman launched two exceedingly humble products, <laughs> Trump the game and the killer of all French cycle races, the Tour de Trump. Um, now this name Trump is possibly something we're going to see a little later in the talk um, this afternoon. Now more seriously though, the year 1989 sits within an historical context in which we were promised a borderless world. On the 14th of June, 1985, five European countries met in Schengen, Luxembourg, to sign an international agreement that would gradually abolish border checks between their common borders. Almost precisely two years later, on the 12th of June, 1987, U.S. President Ronald Reagan stood before the Brandenburg Gate in West Berlin and called on the Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, to tear down the Berlin Wall. Thirteen months later, rock and roller Bruce Springsteen played a concert in East Berlin and voiced his hope that one day all the barriers will be torn down. And in November of 1989, the Berlin Wall began to be demolished, and by October of 1990, the two Germanys were once again united. That same year, the Schengen Agreement was supplemented by the Schengen Convention, which abolished internal border controls and established a common visa policy. The Schengen area operates very much like a single state for international travel purposes, um, with external border controls for travelers entering and exiting the area and common visas, but with no internal border controls. Now, throughout the 1990s, this would further develop and expand to encompass over 15 countries by the end of the 1990s, and it would be enshrined in EU law with 1997's Amsterdam Treaty. Now, the current membership of the Schengen area is 26 countries. And in the face of all these developments, economic globalization, and new forms of global connectivity brought by the World Wide Web. This borderless world seemed more and more like a realistic and almost tangible reality. Here is the Google uh, Books Ngram Viewer. This is an online search engine that charts the frequencies of words and phrases in a database of over 5 million books published between 1500 to 2008. And this shows just how big of a leap the concept of a borderless world took um, starting in the late 1980s. It also reveals that there was a definite downward trend in the early 2000s. And sadly, um, it doesn't reveal um, what has happened since 2008, um, because the database ends in 2008. Um, but I strongly suspect um, that we would see that occurrences of the phrase borderless world have plummeted even more um, since, since then. Now the reasons for this is that despite the 1990s optimism of open and borderless worlds, um, and in spite of the global and instantaneous connectivity offered by the internet, and particularly social media, we live in a world that may be more divided than ever before. With the rising nationalist movements across the globe, and an exponential growth of border walls around the world. Between 1989's fall of the Berlin Wall and May 2018, the number of international border walls or fences have more than quintupled from 15 to more than 77 today. Now some of these are really well known, such as the extensive but non-contiguous hundreds of miles of existing wall or fencing on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, the 160-mile so-called and quite laughably named 
demilitarized zone, or DMZ, that separates North and South Korea. And picture here, in the bottom right-hand corner, um, the West Bank wall that the Israeli government calls a separation or security fence, but that the Palestinians and other wall opponents call the wall of apartheid. Less well known, though, are the dozens of other walls scattered around the world, including the 600-mile highly complex system of barriers under construction by the Saudis on their border with Iraq. And pictured here in the top right-hand corner, the Bangladesh-India border fence that is designed to protect the more than 4,000 miles of frontier that these countries share. Now, nearly all of the border walls that have been developed since 1989 have emerged in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and other planned targets. And in the light of the continuing and global war on terror, it should be little surprise that concern for national security is now pushing back against the idea of an open and borderless world. For better or worse, border walls are a key feature of contemporary global society. For many people in many countries around the world, some of the terrible, tragic, and scary events from recent history are seen as providing legitimate justification for what these people see as the common sense solutions um, of border walls, enhanced security and state surveillance, and even the so-called extreme vetting of refugees and immigrants. Now, controversy abounds, and borders and border walls have once again become a sexy topic to write books about. Um, the one on the far right here came out in 2012, um, but there's really been an acceleration since then. And both Fry's book on the far left um, and Marshall's book arrived only in 2018. Um, after um, I had actually started teaching a course um, on borders uh, in world history um, last semester. Now Marshall's book, the one here in the center, um, it's actually even been released under two different titles. Um, but it's the same book. Um, and uh, sadly, whichever title the book uses, um, it still includes some howling errors in its chapter on Hadrian's Wall, so I won't be including this for the course. Um, uh, nevertheless, walls are, once again, worth talking about. The U.S. government has shut down over border wall disputes, and even the usually sensible and stiff upper lip British um, can't agree on how to proceed when it comes to their own border issues. Um, in short, borders matter today just as much as ever before. I'd now like to spend just a few minutes on what I'll refer to as bad history. Um, this is ignorant, inaccurate, just plain wrong attempts to use the past in order to promote political positions in the present. Now even before the 2016 presidential election, Critics have blasted Donald Trump's plan to build his so-called big, beautiful wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. And as an archaeologist and historian with a particular scholarly focus on ancient frontiers, I'm sympathetic to the president's critics on this issue. Um, one aspect of the fight against Trump's wall, however, has been particularly annoying, um, and that is the persistent references to the wall as medieval. Um, first of all, this seems to ignore the fact that most of the world's most elaborate and longest lasting border walls or imperial frontiers predate the medieval period, sometimes by thousands of years. Um, more importantly though, it's intellectually lazy and reflects what historiographers might call a Whiggish perspective, believing that history follows a path of inevi in inevitable progression and improvement, from unsophisticated barbarism to a state of greater perfection, in which judges the past in light of the present rather than in the light of its own context. 
Now, too often the word medieval is used as a pejorative, intended to denote something like backward, unsophisticated, cruel, violent, archaic, etc. Um, what particularly angers me is when people actually use the word Byzantine to mean the same thing. <laughs> um, but as Eric Weisscott, a professor of medieval literature at Boston College, recently wrote in an article on Vox.com, um, I got a long quote here. So quotes, calling things you don't like medieval is inaccurate and unhelpful. It's inaccurate because we don't live in the Middle Ages. The things that most anger, disgust, or offend us are relatively new in the grand scheme of history. And it's unhelpful because the medieval label reinforces our overconfidence in ourselves and our modernity. When we call something bad medieval, it's an attempt to purify the present by reassigning that objectionable thing to the distant past. Don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating a return to the Middle Ages, but an ideology of inevitable progress is always going to make enemies for itself wherever progress is experienced instead as violence. In the end, it is both more accurate and more rhetorically effective to admit that the bad things around us belong to the same history as the good things. Mass incarceration, the scientific method, terrorism, the automobile, fascism. These are irreducibly modern responses to modern conditions." Unquote. Now, not to be undone, um, not to be outdone, I mean, um, President Trump just had to jump on the let's try to use history to support my position bandwagon. Um, and here is where we get the title of today's talk, Walls and Wheels. Obviously frustrated with the critiques of his planned wall, which had accelerated through the government shutdown, Trump seemed to acknowledge that a wall is a medieval solution. He pointed out that walls have been around for a long time, and he likened them to wheels, which he also called medieval. Which, despite being old technology, according to Trump, continued to be essentially unchanged and indispensable features of contemporary society. Now he repeated this comparison multiple times over several weeks. And in one interview, he even said that and this is a quote. I'll try to say it as Trumpy as I can. A wheel is older than a wall. The wheel is older than the wall. You know what? And there are things, some things, that work. You know what? A wheel works. And a wall works. Unquote. On one level, President Trump is correct. Walls and wheels are super important. <laughs> and both have been around for a very, very long time. Depending on how you intend to use them as well, both have also been proven to be highly effective over thousands of years. Like his critics, though, the president made some pretty egregious historical blunders. Neither walls nor wheels originated in the medieval period. And his assertion that wheels are older than walls is just plain wrong. Historians and archaeologists had a field day reacting to these errors on Trump's favorite social media platform, Twitter. Um, and I'm going to save us all by not showing those reactions. Okay? Um, uh, one respondent, though, noted that this is, quote, a chronology error, roughly on the scale of saying that Instagram stories are older than the Roman Republic. <laughs> now, this is actually a generous assessment. Because this Instagram um, 
commenter was wrong. Um, the world's oldest known city wall dates to the Neolithic period, around 9,000 BC at Jericho in the West Bank. An individual structure, kind of um, building um, walls, date even earlier. While the, the potter's wheel, the very first potter's wheel, doesn't seem to appear until around 3500 BC. And that wheel technology isn't converted for transportation use until four to 500 years later. So honestly, Trump's blunder is actually an error on the scale of saying that Instagram stories are older than the wheel. <laughs> Despite these historical errors, all sides continue to draw upon the distant past in order to support their positions with varying degrees of success, as you might um, see from here. Um, perhaps the most depressing part of this all is that you can never really tell if some of these errors were purposely made to get a laugh, I hope so, um, or if it's because our education systems are woefully failing. My key point here is that we must take greater care when we try to use the past to make political points in the present. And probably more importantly, we must be far more critical of other people's historical claims. Okay, so now we finally reach our main event, okay? The ancient frontiers of the Roman Empire. In order to appreciate the borders of Imperial Roman territory, we need to first recognize that for nearly 400 years, starting with Rome's first Punic War against that North African city-state of Carthage, Rome was fueled by regular and almost continuous territorial expansion. This means that the edges of Roman territory frequently changed and often advanced into new areas, well before Rome enters the historical period that we call the Roman Empire, and there, here, the word empire with a capital E, please, um, during the ascent of Augustus. Um, middle and late Republican Rome was actually, in um, all practical ways, an empire, with a lowercase. By the end of the Republic, Rome's now long history of victory and conquest had become ingrained into the Roman psyche with an expectation that Rome would continue to conquer. Nobody then alive had ever known anything different. And Roman virtues by then were fundamentally shaped by power, praise, and might. A very powerful presentation of this idea was presented in Rome's great epic poem, Virgil's Aeneid, which had been commissioned by the emperor Augustus himself. And writing near the end of the first century BC, Virgil benefited from hindsight um, and could, very conveniently, uh, place eerily accurate, supposedly hundreds of year old, years old prophecies into the mouths of Rome's um, mythical figures. In one prophecy, for example, Rome's chief god, Jupiter, prophesied that the city's founding by Romulus, he prophesied that the city would be founded by Romulus, and he even goes so far as to say that the Roman people and their empire would have no end in space or time. And shockingly, after the empire reaches its greatest ever territorial extent under the expansionist emperor Trajan, who was called Optimus Princeps, or the best ruler by the Roman Senate, and who died in AD 117. His successor, Hadrian, reversed Rome's expansionist policy and focused instead on a new consolidation and containment plan. Hadrian was the first emperor to visit all of Rome's provinces. 
And starting around A.D. 120, he ordered the establishment of clearly marked out borders or frontiers for the empire. And this action probably didn't help Hadrian's poor relationship with the Roman Senate, as it appeared to suggest that Rome's greatness had limits. And it was in opposition to Rome's long-held beliefs and the imperial propaganda that had been communicated by Virgil's epic. It is perhaps surprising, then, that Hadrian's own successor, Antoninus Pius, would maintain Hadrian's frontier-building policy, um, a very unpopular policy, um, and that Antoninus Pius would actually help to ensure that this new approach would shape Roman actions for the remainder of the imperial era. Now, the most famous of all Roman frontiers is Hadrian's Wall um, in the north of England. Uh, but this was just one segment of over 7,500 kilometers of Roman frontiers that stretch across Britain, continental Europe, the Near East, and all the way across <coughs> North Africa. The frontiers that these emperors established ranged widely. An archaeological examination reveals the great diversity of frontier forms, from artificial barriers such as walls and linear earthworks composed of banks and ditches, to rigid lines and military forts that patrolled more natural barriers such as rivers, mountain ranges, and the desert fringe. In some places, such as the Antonine Wall in Scotland, a wall was erected, but this was made from stacked turves or I think the American word would probably be sods. Uh, I'm relearning American vocabulary, okay? Um, instead of stone, okay? So this, this wall wasn't built of stone. It was built out of kind of stacked sod. Across much of Germany, a ditch and bank earthwork featured a timber palisade for some long stretches, but not everywhere. Um, while areas along the Rhine and Danube rivers didn't need an artificial linear barrier at all, but instead, took advantage of the river um, and lines of sight between carefully spaced um, military installations to patrol those areas. A similar strategy was adopted in the desert regions of the Near East and North Africa, although there were some occasional walls that blocked access through particular wad wadis or seasonal river valleys. Perhaps these were designed just to funnel traffic in the direction of the military forts that were far more distantly spread in these areas. The most important thing to observe, I think, is that Rome didn't adopt a one-size-fits-all approach to border or frontier management. But they experimented with different designs. They experimented with new technologies. And they tailored their individual frontiers to the specific context in which they were located. Now, in a recent article in the new online and open access theoretical um, Roman archaeology journal, um, which I was uh, pleased to be the, the initial brain uh, behind, uh, but sadly wasn't uh, the one who implemented it, um, uh, Professor David Breeze, the world's foremost Roman frontier scholar, he offers a challenge for broader Roman archaeologists to actually pay attention to Roman frontiers. And for ancient historians, who often give interpretive primacy to textual, textual sources, to recognize the important value of the archaeological evidence when we think about Rome's frontiers. Now, Breeze highlights that all the evidence, whether it's literary, epigraphic, or kind of inscriptional, um, or archaeological material evidence, um, that it's all important. He also emphasizes the crucial contribution that even find what I have in the past called unimportant minutia um, have actually um, become essential pieces of evidence that overturn what we thought we knew about Rome's frontiers. Professor Breeze also emphasizes just how complex these frontier systems are, 
and he offers a total of 21 different theories um, that people have put forward for what function Rome's frontiers serve. Now he notes that these 21 um, theories, um, and I know you're not going to be able to read them there, they're just there so you can see that there's a heck of a lot, okay? Um, uh, he notes that these are not mutually exclusive and that different aspects of the frontier may have been designed to serve different functions. Um, in fact, he, he illustrates this by taking, I think it's a total of 17 of these 21, um, and saying how all of them are in some way true. They were all different functional aspects of different parts of the frontier. <coughs> some of the more popular theories, though, include um, number one here, um, is the defense against major, major invasions. The second most popular is protection against raiding. This is not full-scale invasion, but small-scale periodic raiding into Roman territory. And this, interestingly, is the most common interpretation of why the Great Wall of China was built. So there's some similarities there. Uh, the fourth option that he has here, which is actually Professor Breeze's favorite, is to control civilian movement. That is keeping tabs on and control over who and what moves through the empire's borders, where they do so, and when. Jumping all the way down to number 14 on this list is having the wall being used as, or the frontiers, as a base for operations beyond the frontier. This is a purely military purpose and a more offensive purpose especially in the context of Hadrian's Wall, where the wall is seen as serving as a kind of springboard for forward attacks by the Romans to areas beyond the frontier. And then I'm just combining number 17, 18, and 19 all together. It's basically the same theory, um, which is that the wall was um, a symbolic statement um, that projected the power and might of the empire and indeed of the emperor Hadrian himself. Now according to our early medieval British sources, the purpose of the Roman frontiers in Britain were to protect the Rome allied population from external attack by invading Picts and Scots. The problem is the Picts and Scots didn't exist when the walls were built. Um, but the Picts and Scots were pesky, troublesome people <coughs> at the time that these early medieval writers were writing about what they thought the wall was there for. Now the literary evidence from the period of the Roman Empire, but admittedly later than when the frontiers were initially built, um, indicates that the Roman walls in Britain were built in order to, quote, separate the Romans from the barbarians, end quote. Now both sets of early literary evidence led to a really long-held belief that the walls were designed as an impermeable barrier, cutting off the Roman province from the area beyond the walls, um, and that you could not pass from one side to the other, other. Now, the idea of the Roman walls as impermeable barriers that completely shut off the empire from barbaricum, and that was manned by soldiers who stood watch for potential invasion at the furthest reaches of civilized territory was strongly persistent. But soon after people started to carry out archeological excavation on Hadrian's Wall, a surprise discovery would require a significant rethink. You guys just give me one minute. I've got a little toy here on the piano. Um, some of my students on my courses uh, today um, have experienced this. This is a 360 camera. Um, I just want to take a photo of like everybody in your glory here, okay? Um, really, it's just uh, um, an exercise trying to get used to how this works because I will be um, hopefully using this in the field uh, in Jordan this summer. So, turn the camera on first. It'll only take a minute. You'll hear a beep. It sounds like R2D2.
doesn't look like it's going to work. That's unfortunate. Alright. It's okay. It was just something fun for me. Um, in 1853, um, workers for a wealthy landowner who had been systematically buying up significant portions of the former Roman frontier realized that the so-called mile castles across the entire line of Hadrian's Wall not only housed soldiers, but also featured gateways through the wall, providing access beyond. And this was first discovered at Mile Castle 42, also called Caulfields. Um, they were originally named based off of kind of the local <coughs> place name, but later on people started to actually give them numbers from one end to the other. So we, we use both names. Um, which can get confusing in Roman frontier studies. Mm -hmm. But the discovery here led to excavations elsewhere, and these confirmed what had previously been considered a very unlikely reality. And this is that the wall, rather than standing as a firm and impermeable barrier that completely shut off the empire from non-Roman barbarian territory, um, Hadrian's Wall had instead been constructed with at least 80 separate access points through the wall. What could this mean? For some scholars, this was evidence that the wall and its mile castle served as a long and nimble base for anticipated forward military action into the territory beyond the frontier. And it has long been recognized that the Roman military had not been designed, equipped, or accustomed to a defensive fighting style. So perhaps the gates were intended to give the soldiers a regular and ready access to marshal forth from the wall and enter formation on an open field of battle where they would be most likely to have the advantage. An alternative, and now the more favored interpretation, is that the gates were intended to allow fairly routine and not only military traffic from one side of the wall to the other. And this might support the view of the wall as a customs barrier, where taxes could be collected by traders, merchants, and travelers um, passing through. And if not specifically for customs and taxation, it would at least suggest that the wall functioned as a mechanism for controlling the movement of people and goods, with the mile castles providing a convenient but controlled crossing point within only a half a mile's walk in either direction. So there was still plenty of good, close by, easy access points. Most importantly, though, the number and regularity of the gateways can leave little doubt that the wall was designed not to stop movement from one side to the other, but to facilitate it in a controlled manner. Exactly whose movement was intended to be facilitated and or controlled remains uncertain, but the frequent evidence for non-soldier occupants in the vicinity of the wall strongly suggests that civilians were also crossing. So if the wall was designed to facilitate movement, just how much movement was happening? While this example that I'm going to share here does not uh, provide definitive evidence for movement to or from the areas beyond the frontier, I'd like to share it as one of my favorite examples of civilians at the edges of the empire. This image here on the right is the elaborate tombstone and bilingual funerary inscription of a woman called Regina, who is the freed woman and wife of Barates, the Palmyrene. So this was uncovered at a Roman fort called South Shields near the modern city of Newcastle upon Tyne, a coastal outpost just beyond the eastern terminus of Hadrian's Wall. And below the standard Latin inscription, which also tells us that Regina was of the Britannic Catavolani tribe, there is a really sad addition in Barate's own Syrian dialect. And it is thought that Barates may have um, made this inscription himself because the execution is um, of a poorer quality than the quite high level of execution of the Latin. 
Um, and in the Syrian dialect it says, Regina, the freedwoman of Barates, alas. And I just can't help but cry. Um, I particularly love this object for several reasons. <coughs> First, I think it's very personal, and it really tugs at the part of my heart that bleeds. Um, secondly, it's really large. Um, it's nearly four feet tall, two and a half feet wide. It's a very elaborate in detail. It may be amongst the ten most elaborate, most expensive tombstones from Roman Britain. Barates clearly loved his wife, and he spared no expense in mourning her death. This probably indicates that Barates was quite a wealthy trader who may have overseen the importation of goods from beyond the Rome, Roman Empire's eastern edges. His home city of Palmyra is in Syria, and it's worth pointing out that this was a crucial trading center on the Silk Road that connected the Roman Empire with the goods of India, Central Asia, and China. This tombstone and its inscription also stands as a visible example of the power of the Roman Empire, and even its often viewed as divisive frontiers. There's a power here to bring people together from all over the world. Here we have a man who came from the furthest reaches of Rome's territories, perhaps even um, from beyond the empire <coughs> itself. He traveled 5,000 kilometers to the opposite extreme in the far northwest. He takes on a local slave girl. He falls in love with her. He frees her and marries her. And perhaps, and I think this is what happened, but it's speculation, I must tell you, um, that Barates renames this former slave Regina. Because the name Regina means queen. It's not the kind of name that a slave would have, but it's the kind of name a, a man would give the wife he loves, uh, particularly in this case, I think. Now, we know of Barates from one other inscription, his own tombstone, from about 20 years later, also found on Hadrian's wall. And I think this, I think this indicates that Barates was so pained by the loss of Regina that he couldn't bring himself to leave Britain, her homeland, where she was buried. Um, and I just think this is a really interesting example of how something that we see as very divisive, um, uh, something that excludes, um, also provides a sense of, of great connectivity. But it's important that I don't paint too rosy a picture of the Roman frontiers. Despite the evidence for their incredible cross-empire connected powers, um, <clears throat> as exemplified by the story of Barates and Regina, and despite the evidence that the um, frontiers were incredibly porous, with dozens of closely spaced access points through mile castle gateways, there's a lot of evidence that these were serious and carefully planned barriers. The Antonine Wall, located in central Scotland, just a little north of modern-day Edinburgh and Glasgow, illustrates this quite well. Here we can see in this diagram um, that what we call the wall is far more complex than just um, a kind of upstanding structure. Even though this wall was not constructed out of stone, like Hadrian's was, it featured a highly complicated in-depth system of barriers and obstacles that were interlinked. The turf rampart um, is what we might best recognize as the wall, even though it only survives to a maximum height of a little over 1.5 meters tall today, it probably stood to a height of at least three meters um, in antiquity. It may have even featured a wooden duckboard walk um, with a timber palisade at the top. So it would have been quite substantially tall um, just north of the rampart, um, and not labeled here, um, is an area called the Burb. You see these little uh, <coughs> pits um, on the bottom of it. Um, the Burb is a flat um, or gently sloping space that has, over the past 20 years, been found to feature 
a series of small pitted ankle breaker obstacles that we call kippy. Um, these probably existed all along the wall for 40 miles from one end to the other. After the berm to the north is the ditch, which is most often the most highly visible remnant of the Antonine Wall in the contemporary landscape. By itself is a monumental earthwork that has an average width of about 12 meters and a depth that often reaches four or more. <coughs> and just north of the ditch is the outer mound, or glass sea, um, which was sometimes constructed from the materials removed during the digging of the ditch. And this, too, was a substantial barrier that frequently heightened the north face of the ditch. And in one place, there are even further pitted obstacles, this time of much larger size, in rows to the north of the Mauer Mound. We call these lilia, um, after similar features that Julius Caesar described as a component of his siege works during his wars in Gaul. Now these are man traps in size and are likely to have featured upright stakes inside of them um, that would have stabbed or impaled anyone who happened to, to fall into them. Now there's something quite serious, sinister, and highly defensive about this elaborate setup. This aura is further reinforced by a collection of inscribed and sculpted stones from the Antonine Wall. We call these the distance slabs because they record the specific distances of wall that were built by each legionary working party. And they also feature, as you can see here, um, elaborately carved depictions of battle scenes, religious rituals, and architectural features that serve to emphasize Roman authority and domination in the region. Now, recent portable X-ray fluorescence research has now revealed that these slabs not only depict these scenes in some gruesome detail, including the severed barbarian head depicted here on the bottom, with a dagger, I guess somebody's foot, <laughs> um, but these were also now understood to have been painted in bright colors dominated by yellows and blood red. Um, that highlighted the bloody aspects of Rome's domination. Each of these slabs um, were almost certainly installed and visible at prominent locations right in the face of the Antonine Wall's ramparts. And they served as propaganda tools that allowed Rome to demonstrate their power over the indigenous peoples of the broader frontier zone and maybe even helped to subdue um, holdouts who had not yet given in the Roman authority. So, to wrap it all up, what do the ancient border walls of the Roman Empire have to say about contemporary border issues? The most honest answer I can give you is I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I have an ambivalence about Roman frontiers. On the one hand, they appear to be violent instruments of oppression, and exclusion. But on the other hand, they could also serve as a means of global connectivity. They are points of both separation and points of encounter. They are far from simple monolithic structures with straightforward purposes. Their life histories are incredibly complex as they underwent significant changes and even substantial revision in periods as short as only 20 years, um, which may have been a complete fundamental rethink of what function they served. So attempting to use border walls from antiquity as ammo in a political battle over contemporary border issues is rife with problems. It should probably be avoided. Um, on that matter, though, I just want to May I suggest that I end um, by pointing out the fact that Imperial Rome's greatest struggles, internally and externally, only came about after the walls were built. That, however, is a different talk. So thank you.
questions, I guess? Yeah. Any questions? It's cool. I don't have to answer questions. Birch. Can't let you get off the dock. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bill. It was really, really, really interesting. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> and uh, I so much appreciate you making it contemporary. Thank you. Um, my uh, question is, you know, that in the construction of ports, which is what we have mostly in the East, uh, there seems to be a uh, transition from uh, using earthen ramps you know, in the, like in the second century, this would be the time of mm -hmm. and, and Antoninus, uh, and basically as marching camps. So there's, the, the theory is those are very temporary. And then in a uh, century and a half later, these forts e evolved into stone structures, so they became much more permanent. Is, you, on the, these walls across England, is there a similar relationship between it seemed like earthen yeah. banks were um, permanent. Well, Roman, Roman for, early, early Roman forts um, tended to be um, kind of uh, turf and timber. Um, that's how they, they, they tended to be up until um, near the late second century. Um, there are some, some early second century, so 100 AD um, forts, though, that are built with stone walls. Um, we have on the Antonine Wall, which was built um, built probably around AD 140, um, occupied for only 20 years and then fully abandoned by AD 160. There are um, two forts on the Antonine Wall that are entirely constructed out of stone. Now, throughout much of the rest of Britain, throughout a lot of continental Europe, and throughout the Middle East, um, turf and timber continue to be kind of the predominant way of constructing forts um, through the entire second century. It's primarily in the third century, um, and even then kind of maybe middle to late third century, where stone becomes kind of the definitive way that they're, they're going to build a fort. Um, and then the shape changes as well. It moves from being this kind of playing card shape with the rounded corners to sometimes having, um, you know, major towers at the corner. Um, they look, uh, you know, maybe a bit more like a I don't know. Um, they've they've got like little round towers off the edge of a of a square. Um, that that becomes a very dominant form. Um, but the Roman Roman fort design absolutely changes over time, and I think part of that has to do with um, just experience. People realize that maybe a different design will actually suit their needs better. Um, but it may also have come from foreign influence. Because after the frontiers get constructed, um, much of the important stuff that's happening in the Roman Empire, um, most of the important action is not happening in Rome. It's happening on the frontiers. The emperors increasingly are coming from the frontiers. The generals are increasingly <coughs> coming from the frontiers. They're not coming from Italy. Um, and I think that a lot of the decision-making power um, is actually um, coming in with not Roman influence, but actually influence from, from far and wide. Is that? Thank you. Okay. Mitch? Um, so some of the top things on the list of like why the Naples was defense, like defense against invasion, defense against raiding. So did the Roman Empire make most of their walls after like after they started like they stopped expanding and they made walls or was it like they kept expanding and making walls throughout No. Um, the, the, the construction of walls at the edges of the empire is an entirely new thing, first done by the Emperor Hadrian. It's never been done before. Yeah. So for 400 years, Rome is expanding, and they're not going to bother making a wall because the, the current border is temporary. It's, it, they, they know it's going to get, it, it's going to go further on because it's their destiny. Basically, they're, they're going to they're control the entire planet. Um, there's even potentially some indications, some ways of reading um, some of those texts by Virgil um, that may suggest that there, there might even be, you know, kind of Roman colonization beyond this world. Um, I don't know if that means kind of colonizing the stars or what, but, you know, I mean, their, their, their idea of their destiny wasn't small. It was kind of Trumpish. Mm -hmm. 
showed you one, one part of the distant slab, just the part of the really interesting sculpted part. Um, but the part here, where I'm standing, um, tells us um, that we, one legion, it's the, the one is escaping my, there's only three of them, um, one of them um, built a section of the wall here for 3,333 and a third paces. Um, and they're, they're very specific and they're clearly telling you it was that. Um, the, the Roman military, when they built things, they wanted the glory. Um, so even to the point that they would actually manually stamp the name of their legion on individual roof tiles. Um, it wasn't done by kind of machine. It was done, you know, by hand. Um, because, you know, if you went climbing on their roof, they wanted, they, they wanted you to know that it was that who built it. Yeah. <laughs> monumental kind of feel, yeah. commercial or... Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's building inscriptions everywhere. Um, so, we know that um, this is a really interesting thing. The, um, the frontiers were built in the second century by Roman legionary soldiers. These were Italian Roman citizen soldiers. Um, but the frontiers weren't operated. They weren't <coughs> garrisoned or manned by... Um, the Roman um, Italian legionary soldiers. Instead, they were garrisoned by auxiliary soldiers, foreigners that had been conscripted or forced into the, the Roman army. Um, and early on, the primary strategy was to go conquer a territory, um, to uh, basically decimate the population a little bit, get rid of the really kind of uh, um, ultra um, kind of violent sorts. Um, to take the ones that were not quite so violent, are not quite so capable, but still could maybe make a decent soldier, um, force them to join the Roman military, um, and send them as far away from home as possible, so that they could then kind of um, uh, serve the Roman army without being in danger of kind of fomenting re rebellion in their homeland. So um, we have on Hadrian's Wall groups of Syrian archers. We know we've got guys from Belgium people from um, modern-day Croatia and Serbia and North Africa. Um, and we have examples um, across other edges of the Roman Empire where we know that there are actually units of, of Britons, people of Britannic tribes. Um, it was only towards the end of the 3rd century, so kind of 270s, 280s, uh, when you start to have local recruitment. And then they have, but by then the frontiers been there for a while. Um, it's relatively pacified. Um, there's probably very little threat of, of local rebellion. Um, so people get recruited locally and, and serve locally. Do we see an interruption of trade and relations with the, the people beyond the wall after these frontiers were created and established by Hadrian? That's a very good question and I would like to be able to answer that. One of the major problems with Roman provincial and Roman frontier archaeology is that archaeologists have had an incredible bias towards the Roman military. We like the Romans. We don't like the 